So we're starting the musculoskeletal system. Um, this is a system that was covered very thoroughly in A and P1. So the bone physiology, the bone locations, what a joint is, how it's put together, all of that stuff you ought to already know. So I'm going to go directly into uh, musculoskeletal pathology, um, breaks and, and sprains and strains and um, cancers of the musculoskeletal system. So we're going to have two lectures on this. Today we're going to start off um, talking about fractures. Um, a fracture is a broken bone, so um, it can be all the way through, it can be part of the way through, it can be um, very serious, it can be fairly minor. Um, classified in a variety of ways. Uh, first of all, a complete or incomplete fracture. If it's complete, it's gone all the way through. If it's incomplete, it hasn't. Incomplete, obviously, is not going to have to be set. It's going to uh, heal a lot easier than a complete fracture, which might become displaced. An open or closed fracture is uh, the uh, closed fracture means it stayed inside your arm or your leg. Open or compound fracture is the term we always use before, anyway, um, is a bone that is sticking out through the skin and has become exposed to the outside. These are much more dangerous because bone infections are really, really hard to treat, um, and they can be life-threatening if, uh, if they aren't taken care of really well. Comminuted fracture is one where you have more than one piece in there. So you could say it was crushed or, or shattered, and so you might have a couple of extra pieces of break in there. Um, linear is you know, straight, oblique is crooked. A spiral flat fracture goes around like this, the kind of fracture you might get if you were twisting on a football field and twisted the, uh, a bone. An occult fracture is one that can't be seen, so even under an x-ray, perhaps it wouldn't show up, but there's actually a break in there. Compression or impaction fracture, is it's smashed down into itself. A green stick fracture is common in kids because bones are soft and twisty and bendy, and it's like trying to break a green stick. It doesn't snap all the way through, it just kind of mushes and breaks a lot of fibers but doesn't completely break. Stress fractures, they're often linear, running the uh, longitudinally on the, on the bone. Um, sometimes they're very hard to see, they could even be an occult fracture usually from overuse, such as distance runners, jump ropers, and the like. So here's a picture of some of them. Oblique fracture, going crooked. Occult might be, a, for instance, in the head of the femur. Somebody with osteoporosis could have a lot of broken tissues in the bone itself without it being able to show up, especially if it's right on the rim, which looks like a separate piece anyway. Open fracture sticking out. A pathologic fracture is caused by dis disease rather than a blow. Comminuted, extra piece in there. Spiral fracture, this does, isn't as good an example as some. They can twist all the way around the bone. Transverse straight across. Green stick is partly broken but not all the way across. Impacted fracture, it's shoved down in itself. It happens to vertebrae a lot. People fall and land on their tailbone, fall off your horse or something, land on your tailbone, and a vertebrae just <laughs> compacts and compresses down into itself. A lot of damage around the broken bone is often as disastrous as the broken bone. It can cut blood vessels. It can cut nerves. Um, the periosteum, that, that um, um, sheath around the outside of the bone that provides a lot of nutrients, and stem cells can be damaged. And usually there's a lot of bleeding in the area. You'll get a swelling, a hematoma, at least around the bone itself, if not actually causing the leg or arm to bulge out. 
So you have a, an inflammatory response. Everything arrives to try to do the repair. It gets hot. It gets painful. It gets swollen. And this formation of the procallus is the hematoma and the beginning of some granulation tissue in there that's the first step in bone healing. So the hematoma, blood tumor, forms around there, bringing lots and lots of um, immune cells and also repairing factors, clotting factors. Granulation tissue forms pretty quickly, and it forms a, um, a bunch of loosely formed cells around there that will provide a scaffolding for the actual bone to grow into. And then it forms this callus, and the callus is actually a, um, it's a fibrous callus at first. It's fibroblast, forms, uh, starts forming some trabecular or, or um, spongy bone in there, solidifies it some. Probably you couldn't really walk on it yet, although you might be able to stagger a little bit around. Then the osteoblasts come in, they add bone matrix and form a bony callus. The bony callus is a big blob of bone around there that has now made it strong enough that you can walk on it. And then remodeling occurs with both osteoblasts adding bone, osteoclasts taking it away. So you can see, I mean, this is an artist rendering, but these, these are the kind of bone breaks they found on prehistoric humans who didn't know how to set a bone. And if the person survived, if their family was able to feed them and stuff until they could walk again, a bone broken and displaced this badly could heal pretty well, um, even sort of kind of straight. Here's a callus. This was a, around probably an osteoporotic uh, bone that kept breaking and reforming and breaking and reforming over time. It's a bony callus. There's usually numbness with the bone break right away. There may be um, uh, pain around the area, but the, the area of the break itself could be numb for a short time. Um, the limb, uh, it's a complete fracture, of course, can be offset, swollen, hot, and it tends to cause muscle spasms. A, a broken femur is especially hard to set because the quadriceps and hamstring muscles are so strong and they spasm and pull the bone past itself, and it often requires a, a pretty strong pull to pull it out so that it can get back in alignment. Closed manipulation and, and traction are the most common. Putting, a, you know, setting it from the outside and then putting a cast or something on it. Open reduction happens if it's so bad that they have to go in and add screws and plates and the like. Most common casting of a relatively simple break. A more complicated version that actually screws into the various parts of the bone and holds it in place. You can see the fibula here was broken in a couple of places. If you don't set it, obviously it can set poorly, and you might even have to have it rebroken and straightened. A displacement doesn't actually break the bone. It just takes two bony parts of a joint and moves them out of alignment. A true displacement takes the entire thing and moves it somewhere else so that the joint is no longer touching where it's supposed to. A subluxation is where part of it moves off to the side. It's still in contact with the bone, but it's out of alignment. There's not a whole lot of difference. Um, but subluxations can occur, especially if you have a sesamoid bone in one of your tendons and it gets bumped off to the side. It's fairly common um, to have a patellar subluxation. 
if you're playing a sport and you land pretty hard on your knee, it can just push the kneecap off to the side, and it takes quite a bit of popping strength to get it back in position, and it's really painful. Very common in female volleyball players. They're always going down on a knee to, to play a ball. Women have looser tendons and ligaments than males do. It's why they're more flexible than we are. And hitting that, even with a knee pad on, hitting it hard enough can sublux the uh, kneecap off to the side. It also can be caused by disease that causes a deterioration of the plateau that the, that the uh, kneecap sits on. And so there's nothing on either side to kind of hold it centered. Um, one of the best overall treatments, once you get it back in, is to do some leg work on the vastus medialis or vastus lateralis, whichever one you need to be stronger to help pull that kneecap back in position. A strain is to a muscle or the tendon that's holding that muscle to a bone. A sprain is a ligament damage. So strain, if you strain your quadricep or you strain your Achilles tendon, those are strains. A sprain is a sprained ankle, a sprained knee, a sprained shoulder that damages the ligaments. Evulsion fractures actually occur, it's kind of a combination of, of ingredients. If you damage, uh, if you sprain the ankle so hard, for instance, that it really, really dorsiflexes hard, the Achilles tendon gets strained too. So you might have a sprain and a strain and an avulsion because it, the Achilles tendon actually pulls off a piece of the calcaneus. And there's a little piece of bone hanging up there. It's fairly common in snow skiers. It's called a skier's thumb. And you fall down and you've got the pole in your hand and it bends your thumb back and causes an avulsion fracture where the tendon holding your thumb in place actually pulls a piece of bone loose um, from where it's attached. Tendon disease, tendon inflammation, bursa disease, bursa uh, um, inflammations, these are very common. Tendonitis, bursitis, um, extremely painful, uh, usually requires rest, anti-inflammatories, sometimes even a steroid shot in there. Tendonitis is inflammation of the tendon. Tendinosis is when the tendon starts to actually remodel and and get wider and add scar tissue in there in its attempt to try to, to protect itself. Bursitis, inflammation of that bursa sac that is underneath the tendons that are rubbing across the top of it. They've tried to protect the tendons, but if it becomes inflamed, it becomes extremely painful and hard to move the arm. And uh, bursitis is usually repetitive. You know, tennis players, racquetball players, carpenters, people who are doing these kind of overuse kind of um, activities. Septic bursitis is if you get an infection in there. For instance, you have a bursa right on the end of your, of your um, elbow, and if you lean down and a splinter or something goes up inside there and takes bacteria in, you can actually get an infection inside the bursa. Couple tendon and bursa, bursa um, inflammations that are quite common. Uh, tennis elbow, lateral epicondylitis. So on the lateral epicondyle, you, where you have the atten, uh, uh, attachment, you have bursa under it, you have an attachment of the tendon of your, of your uh, lower arm muscles, and this tennis elbow actually comes from backhands. This is the kind of motion that causes tennis elbow. Golfer's elbow, medial epicondylitis, it's from the swing of the golf club 
inward across your body this way and causes the pain there. It's really hard to cure. I mean, you can let it, you know, not do anything for six months. But people who get tennis and golfer's elbow are usually really serious tennis and golfers, and they don't sit well. So getting it operated on is actually not, a, not an uncommon treatment for it, and it's usually pretty um, successful. A good friend of mine on the little island we moved from ran a dive shop, and she was a serious tennis player her whole life, and she got tennis elbow so bad she couldn't play, and she was totally depressed about it. One of her dive customers happened to be an orthopedic surgeon, and he said, uh, oh, I'll fix that for you. And she said, well, we don't actually have a hospital on the island. We have a, you know, kind of a, almost a clinic, but it doesn't have an operating room. He said, that's okay. I can sterilize everything well enough. So while her husband assisted him, this doctor fixed her elbow, and it was fine. It worked well afterward. Tendinopathy, bursitis, bursitis in the knee, shoulder, shoulders get bursitis more than anything. Um, uh, tendinopathy, tendinosis, is common in the Achilles tendon. The Achilles tendon is, gets a lot of wear and tear, especially if you're pretty active, play sports, run a lot, and it um, gets inflamed down in the area of the calcaneus and starts calcifying and putting scar tissue in, and it can double in size. This is a, a kind of an example of it. Uh, my wife had this. Um, it's very common to athletes who move into their 40s and 50s and continue working out, especially if you run uphill. It's usually females because a female has a high arch which tills her calcaneus downward and puts pressure on the Achilles tendon that's right behind it. And so when you're running, the calcaneus is constantly rubbing against the Achilles tendon, causing it to inflame and scar up. And it's called a Haglund deformity, a pump bump, because women who wear pumps with hard heels that pushes that Achilles tendon against that curved calcaneus will get it too. And what they do is they cut in from the side. In my wife's case, they actually had to remove the Achilles tendon, carve down the, uh, the calcaneus, reattach it with screws, and then six months later, you're able to actually do stuff on it again. Here's a kind of overall look at the, at the um, sequence of events. Um, compression of the, of the limb, swelling that causes a block of blood flow, leading to compartment syndrome and even crush syndrome if the, if the swelling gets so, um, so bad, um, a Volkman con contracture where the, the um, muscle starts to die and pulls in on itself. Compartment syndrome can also happen just from a blow to your shin, the side of your shin, because you're, especially in your lower leg, the, um, you're in such a tight, strong sheath that if you get any swelling of the muscle, it compresses so hard it blocks off blood flow and the um, muscle can die in there. Looking at muscles themselves, a strain is when you lengthen a muscle too fast for its own good or too far for its own good, too more, more than it can handle, and it does a lot of micro damage inside the muscle. It can damage cells, in which the case they can recover. It can kill cells, in which case they don't, and you start getting scarring in there where the cells 
used to be. Myositis ossificans, this means adding bone, happens when you have repeated muscle blows or muscle strains that gradually kill more and more cells. They um, add fibrous tissue and then actually ossify. Osteoblasts are constantly patrolling the, the body. You know, they'll, they'll add calcifications to cardiac plaques to try to stabilize them. They add calcifications in the muscle tissue and it makes the muscle stiff and, and not as flexible and not work as well. It's fairly common in, again, thigh muscles of football players that get receive blow after blow after blow after blow to their thighs. And if you do enough muscle damage, compartment syndrome, crush syndrome, compartment syndrome, the muscle swells up inside that sheath, the pressure is so high in there, it starts dying for lack of blood flow in there. The main treatment is to make a long slice in the um, sheath and let the pressure, release the pressure so blood flow can resume. But uh, rhabdomyolysis means that the, usually due to either infection or lack of blood flow, the cells start to die. And lice, they turn into juice. And rhabdo means striated muscle breakdown. And it results in atrophy and also the Volkmann's fracture, I mean uh, uh, contracture from the muscle pulling in on itself. We've all heard of osteoporosis. It's a more and more common disease in our society these days. People live longer, so they have more time to lose bone mass. Um, they're less active, more likely to be sitting at computer stations or watching TV in the evening instead of doing something physical, and a lack of weight-bearing exercise on bones causes them to lose calcium. Normal bone density, 833 milligrams per cubic, uh, I mean for, uh, yeah, for, it says square centimeter, but probably should be cubic. But the, um, you don't have to memorize this number. What you need to know is that if you drop below that, you are in what's called osteopenia. Penia means not enough of. So erythrocytopenia means you don't have enough red blood cells. Osteopenia means you don't have enough bone. And if it drops down 20% below this, approximately, you're in osteoporosis. So that's a good thing to remember from normal, any drop is osteopenia, a 20% or more drop would be osteoporosis. And you can see there's hardly any bone here. It looks like lace. Very easy to fracture. It's real brittle. Osteoporosis, um, more common in women than men although men get it too, um, it will tend to, tends to form in hips and um, spine a lot. The kyphosis of the older person is caused by kind of a collapse of the vertebrae. Um, a lot of people break their hips. Sometimes they fall down and break their hip. Other times they just make, take a turn and their hip is so weak it breaks and then they fall. Decreased levels of estrogen after uh, menopause is a, a start for women, and that happens right around age 50. So they don't have as, as thick of bones as men do to start with anyway, 
They start losing their bone mineralization earlier because men lose it with the loss of testosterone, but that's very gradual over time and isn't serious until you get well into your 70s. And so there's an extra 20 years that the female has a tendency to lose bone mass. Decreased activity level, weight-bearing exercise is good for uh, calcifying bones. If you don't have enough calcium or vitamin D, C, maybe two, or uh, magnesium, but uh, calcium and vitamin D are the big players. Iatrogenic, iatrogenic means caused by medicine, caused by the medical person. So you might be given a cancer treatment that actually causes leaching of calcium from your bones. I mean, it can be improper or it can be something you need and you just have to put up with the calcium loss. Cushing, excess cortisol, can cause a loss in bone mass too. Osteoporosis, here we have normal, so that you have the, the uh, uh, compact bone and the spongy bone. Osteopenia, you're starting to get holes in the compact bone and bigger holes in the spongy bone. By the time you get to severe osteoporosis, you have more space than you have bone. Tends to be worse in women because they start losing it earlier and they didn't have as, as thick of bones to begin with. So here we have men start out with more and they don't lose it as fast. Women start out with less and lose it more and you wind up with very thin compact bone on the outside, not enough strength. Here's the kyphosis I was talking about, that hunchback, rounding of the back due to osteoporosis. The term malacia means softening. You can have chondromalacia, which is a softening of cartilage. Osteomalacia means a softening of bones. And Usually, uh, there are a couple of diseases that cause osteomalacia, but the most common cause of osteomalacia is either inadequate calcium or vitamin D levels or an inability to process those into bone mineralization. And it's typically called rickets, soft bones. They don't grow as as fast or long, and they're too soft, um, too big uh, populations um, before 1900 that had rickets in the world. You had the um, inner city kids in London where it rains a lot, there's not enough sunshine, and the buildings made more shadows, and they didn't get enough vitamin D. Their calcium intakes were okay, but they couldn't use the calcium because vitamin D is required for the absorption and processing of calcium. So you were getting rickets in Europe. On the other side of the world in Asia, people's diets didn't have enough calcium. There was plenty of sun, but their, calcium di their diets were very low in calcium, and so pictures and drawings of uh, early you know, Europeans discovering Asia, Japan, China, Japan, and, 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 and the guys were short and bow-legged. Very common rickets. Paget disease is one of these incredibly unfortunate, uh, uh, unfortunate situations where the um, uh, bones are simply not processing properly. They keep um, melting away in one place and adding bone in another. And they don't add compact bone, they add spongy bone. And so 
you lose bone from this side, you add it to this side, and the bone just distorts and grows completely out of shape. Itis is inflammation. Myelo is bone marrow. And osteo means bone. So osteomyelitis is an inflammation of the bone marrow. In fact, it's an infection that works its way into the bone marrow. It's usually caused by an open wound that lets that bone get infected. It can start out as a as an infected cyst in the cortical part of the bone that works its way into the marrow too. Um, it's hard to treat. It's life-threatening. It's limb-threatening. One problem is it causes so much inflammation and so much swelling and damage to vasculature that you can't get antibiotics to it. And you can't get your own immune cells there because there's not enough blood flow. And if you get the oxygen, I mean, the immune cells there, they don't have enough oxygen to create the oxidative burst that helps kill the bacteria that are in there. And for this reason, hyperbaric oxygen is sometimes used for osteomyelitis because it supersaturates the tissue with oxygen and at least allows the immune system to function in there. Osteomyelitis, in this case, a little infection that spreads, works its way down into the medullary cavity. And remember, this, is, this medullary cavity is what we think of as the bone marrow, but there's bone marrow throughout the um, spongy bone as well. Breaks through the periosteum, pus starts leaking out into the, under the skin, or if it's open, it can leak out entirely. And arthritis simply means joint inflammation. Osteoarthritis means bone and joint inflammation. There's almost nobody who doesn't get some amount of, osteo of osteoarthritis if you live long enough. Um, osteoarthritis is caused by use during your life. You wear down the articular cartilage until bone starts rubbing on itself. It makes it very painful. It uh, brings in the immune response and it swells and gets all swollen and painful and red and, and hot and it doesn't work well. Um, it's not an infection and it's not an inflammation inflammation of the joint capsule. It's the bone itself on the, the ends of the bones. And anytime you get inflammation that lasts too long, the inflammation itself starts doing damage to the tissues that are in there. Loss of articular cartilage, formation of bone spurs as the bone is damaged and tries to reheal itself and that makes it even worse, it rubs on itself. Idiopathic, in other words, it's not necessarily caused by a car wreck or a, although that can exacerbate it, but usually there's no particular reason it started, it just, the ends of your bones are a little bit worn. So the older you are, long-term mechanical stress, get arthritis in whatever you use too much. Some endocrine disorders can make it worse by changing your um, bone density. Here's a worn away head of the femur and acetabulum. Ossification, adding a bone in there. This person's probably gonna need a hip replacement. causes these nodules, double bumps on the top of your fingers. If you start seeing 
big bumps here that you can't get your ring on and off because it not only the joint's big but has bumps on it, you're working your way toward, toward osteoarthritis. It hurts worse when you, when you work it. However, up to a point, it's still good to exercise, lubricate the joints, and keep range of motion. The stiffness actually gets better during exercise. You get up and you walk around like this, but after a while, you can walk a little better. Tenderness and deformity. Deformity in, in, the, in the knees is common. The, the tibial plateaus and stuff kind of collapse on themselves, kind of like this kyphosis of the upper spine. Person gets shorter. My dad was always six feet tall his whole life, and by the time he was 85, he had lost about three inches of height. His legs had bowed a little bit. His back was bowed. I'm trying to do a lot of exercise and hopefully delay any such thing with me if I'm lucky to live as long as he did. Rheumatoid arthritis is a, an autoimmune disease. So here, your immune system is attacking your joints. It causes inflammation in the synovial fluid itself, causes inflammation in the joint, uh, uh, the ends of the bones, the joint capsule. Um, it's, it kind of feels like osteoarthritis. I mean, if you get so you can't move your fingers, you can't move your fingers. But um, it's not due to overuse. It's due to an unfortunate uh, decision of your immune system to attack your joints tends to happen to older people more than younger. You have um, rheumatoid factors. These are, uh, it's actually an antibody that attacks other antibodies and causes an inflammatory response. The joint expands with this milky um, uh, fibrous exudate or the um, synovial fluid in there becomes thick and viscous and more like jelly and um, swells. Neutrophils become activated, inflammatory cytokines. They start breaking down the tissue in the muscle uh, or cartilage and bone because they're actually attacking that instead of attacking bacteria. tends to creep up on you. First signs are actually systemic, kind of a malaise and feeling bad and headaches and uh, loss of appetite and, and so forth before you develop any really serious joint problems. Um, it tends to start in the hands and feet, migrates into the bigger joints, knees and the like. And then um, joint deformities. So here we have the macrophages, the, the plasma cells, which are now producing antibodies. Um, and the cartilage, start because it becomes damaged, it starts building a granulation tissue that theoretically would help heal it. But because it doesn't stop, the granulation tissue continues to grow in there until it fills up part of the joint capsule so that you can't move as well. It's called panis. It's a flat layer of granulation tissue that builds up in there. And starting in the hands tends to cause this ulnar drift, the hands that bend out in, on the side like this and become nearly unusable. Nodules are more likely to be on the large joints rather than out on the finger joints. Ankylosing spondylitis is a similar type of 
of disease to rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it has a tendency to affect the spine a lot. Um, spondylo is one of the terms for spine. And ankylosing means stiffening. What happens is you, your immune system is attacking your um, spinal discs, your intervertebral discs, causing deterioration of the discs and the bone itself. The bone is constantly trying to heal, reheal itself, and it winds up growing together and fusing. And so you damage the bone so you become crooked, and then you, you fuse that way so you can't straighten up again. Infl inflammation, uh, vertebrae, and at the sac sacroiliac joint. So it causes the, the joint to fuse in an abnormal position. And this starts relatively early. Fortunately, it's quite rare. But it progresses over time, during your whole lifespan. Um, tends your, your loss of your lower back curve and an activation of the upper back curve. So the lordosis that's normal goes away. Kyphosis develops more, and you wind up bent over. Here's the damage to the bone that has caused it to curve. This is a really powerful curve here, and a fusion of these vertebrae here. This is bone growing through here. And this is a very um, uh, famous picture of this guy that developed it as a young man in 1947, and it shows the progression of it over his lifespan. And gout. Gout is a joint inflammation. Um, almost always starts at the base of the big toe. I had gout for a short time. Have no idea why I got it. It's more common in people that eat a lot of kind of, of, of rich foods. It used to be the disease of the wealthy in Europe. You know, they would become slightly obese. They would eat nothing but red meat and red wine and stuff, and, and you know they would develop these big swollen feet and have to walk around with canes. And it was um, during the time I lived on the island, um, we had very poor access to fish because the fishermen, every time they caught fish, would sell it over to St. Martin where the prices were better. And so I ate more red meat on that island than I've eaten it anywhere in my life. And I developed gout in one of my big toe joints for, it was a, almost a year it was hurting. And it was extremely painful. It finally went away. It's actually an inability to process uric acid, um, which is produced with digestion of proteins and, and things. And, and so um, uric acid crystals can cause um, bladder stones or kidney stones or various stones, but they can also crystallize in your joints and cause gout. Here it is, swollen, fiery, angry, and so painful you can barely walk on it. You can form kidney stones, uric stones. That's only one kind of kidney stone, but it will form them. Males are more uh, prone, older, high intakes of alcohol, red meat, fructose. I don't think I was eating much fructose there. But I did sit on the patio and watch the ships go by and have my cocktail in the evening. And I ate too much red meat, probably. Or maybe I was just unlucky. OK, there's the first one. <clears throat> 